Welcome to another study of the book of the Revelation of John. We're thankful that you have uh, joined us this evening to study God's word. Um, as we have already been um, made out, we've already, should I say, made our way to chapter uh, five, we have been looking at the uh, second half of the picture that John has been uh, allowed to see. And what John saw as we re review is the heart of the book is that four and five is the bedrock of this book. John sees God, the Father, sitting on the throne. Uh, he sees uh, the 24 elders, which is representative of God's people, the redeemed um, around that throne. The uh, angelic host are also around that throne, and they are praising God, <coughs> praising God for who he is um, and what he's going to accomplish in the lives of those believers who are still living at that time, going through Roman persecution. But then John sees in chapter 5, John will see uh, the Lamb. He will first describe him as uh, the Lamb, uh, uh, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, uh, the Root of David. He will also see where this Lamb, uh, this Lion, uh, will then transform it, or not transform, but this lion will also be described as the lamb of God, the lamb that was slain. Uh, this lamb uh, is now standing, and John sees Jesus uh, as the lamb, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, bearing the authentic marks of, uh, of slaughter, the, mar the, the marks of of crucifixion. <clears throat> he sees the Lamb standing. And what a marvelous picture John has been allowed to see that Jesus is still on the throne. But then he sees the Lamb, he will go proceed to take the book from the Father, he who sits on the throne, and he will begin to open the seals. Uh, and so what we also see is this Lamb is also equal in his worship, in worship to him. Uh, the father is worshiped, uh, the lamb is worshiped. And so John paints this picture for us. He paints the picture for the children of God at the time this book was written to give them the assurance of knowing that God is on the throne. And church, that's what we need to bear in mind as we uh, live in this wretched and sinful world, we need to first just, just ponder the thought that God is on the throne. That's victory all by itself. That's victory in and of itself, that our God is on the throne. And uh, that our Savior stands in the midst of the throne. And so we have victory. We have a guarantee of victory. Well, let us read chapter 5 uh, and pick up where we uh, left off. John says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was uh, able to open the book uh, to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And the one and one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So now what John shows us is that this lamb that was uh, able to open the book is now the worthy lamb. So we can write down in our notes, Jesus is the worthy lamb. Not only is he a lamb that was slaughtered, but now alive, but now because of his death and because of what his death accomplishes for us, he is the worthy lamb. He will then be the one who induces praise and worship uh, because of who he is. So, John says there was no one found worthy except 
the lamb that was slain and now standing. So now he is a worthy lamb. And I saw between the throne uh, with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as, slain, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So now this lamb is standing. This lamb uh, was a slaughtered lamb. So we've got the lamb being a worthy lamb. This lamb was a slaughtered lamb in that he, he gave his life as a ransom for us. And then John sees something else about this lamb. The third thing about this lamb is that this lamb is now a living lamb. And what a blessing we have to know that the lamb that was slaughtered, that was slain, crucified on the cross, has now been given life again. He sits uh, on the right hand of the Father. According to John, he's standing in the midst of the throne with the Father, and he is alive. We have life because of the life giver, Jesus Christ. And so he says he's a worthy lamb. He was a slaughtered lamb, and I thank God John says he was <laughs> Slaughtered, but he is now a living lamb. But let's pick out something else we find out about this lamb. This lamb I saw between the throne with four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as slain, having seven horns. So now we know that seven complete, seven uh, horns, should I say, also signifies power. That was always given to those in authority, kings and rulers. Uh, 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 statues were um, paint a picture with horns on them. Horns always represented or signified power and authority. He says, well, this lamb has seven horns, which means he has complete and ultimate power and authority. So this lamb isn't a mild meat lamb that uh, that that uh, was used and abused, uh, uh, if you will, against his will. This lamb, the power in this lamb is that he allowed them to lead him to the slaughter. This lamb allowed uh, mankind to take him to the cross so that he would die for us. Matter of fact, there's power in the restraint of the lamb because the lamb could have easily called out a legion of angels to do his bidding to destroy his enemies. But the lamb knew that the primary mission was to head to the cross so that he may save the world from sin. And so this lamb is a all-powerful lamb. It would do you good to look at uh, Daniel chapter 8 and notice how the, the word horn is describing authority and power. Uh, Daniel chapter 8. And so this lamb, church, is a all-powerful lamb. Uh, this lamb, and you could even say this lamb is the accepted lamb because the only blood, the only sacrifice that is accepted uh, comes from this lamb, which was the sinless lamb. This lamb, his blood was pure. His blood is sanctifying blood. His blood is forgiving blood. It washes away our sins. And the only person that could uh, God would accept as this sacrifice would be the lamb. So this lamb is a worthy lamb. This lamb was a slaughtered lamb. This lamb is now a living lamb. This lamb is a uh, accepted lamb, and this lamb is a, is a powerful lamb. And when it comes to acceptance, I want you to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and then echo uh, Isaiah chapter 53, um, verse 7 through 11. But you can read all of Isaiah chapter 53 to see how Isaiah prophesied of this lamb that is accepted by God. It, it pleased God to bruise him and to crush him. Uh, this is the only lamb that makes us accepted in the sight of God. It's the lamb. He's worthy. He's living. He was a slaughtered lamb. He is an accepted lamb. He's an all-powerful lamb, which means this lamb, it has not only authority over creation, it means the lamb ought to have authority in our life. 
And so this lamb, not only is he all powerful, but this lamb is an all-knowing lamb. Look at this. He says, this lamb has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. I want you to notice uh, a passage of scripture. Come with me to 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Well, look at verse number 7. It says, At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims uh, an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For, now watch verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Now, what do we have? We have the, the lamb being all-knowing. He, he, is, he is everywhere. He sees all. And uh, uh, in, in the second Chronicles passage, it says the eyes of the Lord are over and everywhere uh, benefiting all of those who have his heart, who have their heart set on him. Well, Look at the consolation in Revelation chapter 5. Jesus, the lamb that was slain, is a all-knowing lamb. And church, it would have blessed their souls because those that, are, that were faithful to the Lord, they would have read, understood that this lamb is all-knowing. This lamb is working on our behalf. This lamb loves us. It's saying it's true. It goes without saying, even for us today, this lamb is all-knowing. This lamb loves us. This lamb is working for our benefit, toward our benefit. This lamb will see to it that we are victorious. God will give us everything we need in order to, to persevere whatever the trial. This is the blessing of being in fellowship and <clears throat> excuse me, and in a relationship with the Lamb. He is a all-knowing Lamb. Now, notice he says, He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a heart and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So now we have uh, the worship of the lamb. So not only is he a worthy lamb, but he is a lamb that demands worship. And so what God does for us, church, when God reveals himself, we call it revelation and response. When God reveals himself to us, the best thing for us to do, the most important thing, for us to do is to bow down and worship him. <clears throat> Notice when what we'll see, they aren't simply bowing down to God and to the Lamb because of what they do or what they can accomplish. We they bow down to the Lamb, they respond to the Lamb, positively to the Lamb for who He is. Watch this. Worthy are you. Look at the they worship the Lamb as the Redeemer. Oh, worthy are you to take the book, break its seals, for you were slain, look at the church, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue, people, and nation. Oh, now let's back up a little bit. The response is worship. The response is awe and adoration because this lamb was not only worthy to open the book that would hold our destiny in his hand and the book that would tell us the fate of our enemies, but the lamb, something about this lamb John hones in on that he was slain. 
He was, and with his precious blood, he purchased men. You remember in chapter 1, John would start the letter off victoriously by saying, God have, has made us a kingdom and priests only through the blood of the Lamb. Are we made a kingdom? Are those that are saved, the redeemed, uh, made priests in his kingdom? What do they do? They offer sacrificial worship to God and to the Lamb. We are priests, church, and thank God we have the, the, uh, the, uh, the ability, the, the opportunity to worship God. I always say to the saints at Liberty City, God, when it comes to worship, has invited us. God initiates the worship, and God invites us to come enter in and to worship him. When you approach it in that manner, it takes worship. You're thinking about worship, your attitude toward worship, your disposition in worship to a different place because you understand that you were unworthy, you are unworthy, yet you are allowed into the presence of a, un, of a holy and more, more than worthy God to worship him. God, look at this. God invites us to offer worship to him. So it is a privilege, but it is also by divine invitation that we say yes to worshiping him. We worship him because he is our redeemer. We worship him because he was the only one worthy to open the book. We worship him as a positive response to Almighty God and the worthy Lamb. Notice what they do. You have the you have the uh, uh, the four. Uh, you have the twenty four elders. Look at this church symbolic, signifying the redeemed. All of the redeemed of God's people. What are they doing? Worshiping, praising God. So here are some saints that have been redeemed, but they have now been martyred, as you'll see in chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. They have been slain, yet the blessing is that they are in the presence of God. What are they doing? Worshiping him, praising him, glorifying him, honoring him. Church, we often as preachers, we make the we make the statement that when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this, and I'm going to ask the Lord this, I'm going to talk with Paul. Really, church, you won't do any of that. What you're going to do is be in such awe and such a reverence that you will be praising God throughout eternity. What a blessing. What joy. Because in chapter 7, he says God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Every hurt, every pain, every trouble, all will be wiped away. And church, it's because we will be in the presence of God and in the presence of the Lamb, and we're going to worship Him. What a hallelujah good time we're going to have in heaven. That's why you ought to make sure heaven is where you're striving to go, not on this earth. We put so much emphasis on, on what we can attain in this earth, on this earth, time side of life, on, on this earth, what I can gather, what I can, what I can have at my disposal, but you not uh, Christians must never make uh, the earth their permanent dwelling place. We will, uh, as the children and people of God, seek to make heaven where we're going. Heaven where we're going to worship. Heaven where we're going to spend eternity with God. Heaven where we're going to be forever in the presence of God. We need to start preparing for worship now so that we'll, we'll praise him then. He, they are in heaven, church. Saints that are in heaven, but there's something else that they have. They, these elders, they each one have a bowl and a heart of, of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, don't miss this. So you've got the saints that are praying. You're going to see this again in chapter 8. Around the altar of, of incense. You, you are going to see where the saints who are living are praying to God. Their prayers go up to God as an incense. And then you have the saints. Look at this. 
the saints who are already slain and in the presence of God, praying to God, and their prayers are going up to, the, to, to God on the altar as incense. He says they each have a, a bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. They sing a kind of song, not new in time, but new in quality. They sing a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book, break the seals, for you were slain. Purchase God with your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, and people, a nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. In other words, the Christian wins, because you're going to see, as we read through the book of the Revelation, when John uses the phrase, those who dwell on the earth, you're going to see that those who dwell on the earth, he is talking about Christians. Those who dwell on the earth, he makes a distinction between those who worship the beast, those who bow down to Caesar, those who have uh, who have uh, sold their souls, if you will, to the Roman Empire and to the Roman Emperor. They are the ones that John describes as dwelling on the earth. But notice what John says to the saints. We reign on the earth. In other words, we win. We cannot lose because of the Lamb. Now, what do we have, church? We have reverence, we have praise, and we have dependence. So we have reverence because of who he is, praise because of what he has accomplished in terms of his the salvific uh, accomplishment of the cross. He died for us. His blood was shed for us. His blood has purchased us and it has made us something, made us a kingdom and priest. Well, then we have dependence because now he says the bowls, which are the uh, bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints are going up before God. So now, church, what do we have in worship? Prayer. Prayer, church, is, uh, is, is, is worship in and of itself. He says this prayer, these prayers of the saints, church, is what goes before God. Now, when you get to chapter uh, 8, you're going to see that those, those, those bowls of incense, those prayers of the saints, uh, will now be taken by the angel and cast to the earth, and God's judgment will now reign upon the Roman Empire. Now, we've got reverence. That's the attitude, church. That's the attitude of worship now. Reverence, right? Praise and dependence. You are saying to God, I praise you, Father, for who you are. I, I worship and I adore you. My attitude is reverence because you, it is all, I'm awestruck as to who you are, awestruck as to what you were willing to go through for us. Oh, my goodness. And I'm depending on you. So in my worship, I pray to you, signify I am depending on the one that I show reverence to, depending on the one that I show praise to. And might I suggest to you, and, and you can you can do your own word study, but this praise, church, isn't necessarily quiet. This praise isn't quiet praise. And when you understand who God is, when you understand who the Lamb is and what the Lamb accomplished for your concerning your salvation, you can't help but praise him. So, church. You have the dependence of prayer. Look at Psalms chapter 141, if you will. Psalms chapter 141. Psalms chapter 141. Notice verse number one. O oh Lord, I will call upon you. Hasten to me and give ear to my voice when I call you. My, may my prayer be counted as incense before you. The lifting of my hands as the evening offering. And these prayers, of, these, these prayers, of, uh, these incense would be on the prayers uh, of devotion. The pra I meant the, the altar, which was the prayer, uh, the altar of devotion, uh, the burnt offerings, 
uh, where one would sacrificially uh, give the animal that would take its place, the person, the worshiper's place, where they would then consecrate their lives to God. And the entire animal would be consumed on the altar by, by fire. Well, it, and it would go up to heaven as incense. Well, it shows here that the martyrs, the Christians who were slain, their life itself was a, a sacrifice to God. And so their life, their prayers go up to God as a sweet aroma to our God. On the throne, who sits on the throne, who has the book in his hand that the Lamb now has taken and broken its seals, it is now time, it, we are approaching judgment on those who have persecuted God's people. That's the consolation we have. But that's, but here it is, that's why we worship. We worship because we understand who is sovereign, who is control, who in control, who sits on the throne, who was slain and now is still standing, who has redeemed us, purchased us, has bought us from the slave market of sin, and now have made us royalty. Now he's made us a kingdom and priest. So he says, then I looked, verse 11, church, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, might, honor, and glory and blessing. And every created thing which was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor, glory, dominion forever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped him. Church, that's high praise. That's high worship that uh, they would um, ex exalt the risen Savior. They would exalt the Lamb, church, who has no spot or blemish. That, that this Lamb, through his blood, has redeemed every tribe, tongue, people, and every nation, church. He includes everyone. Everyone who would dare give their life to him. Everyone that, has, that he has saved from the wrath of God and from the tyranny of the devil. He, he deserves and he demands our worship and our praise. May our songs uh, glorify him. May our prayers acknowledge him. And may our worship be all about him. God bless you. Father God, we thank you for this awesome privilege of studying your word. We thank you for the lamb that was slain and is now standing. We thank you, Father, for your wise plan to redeem us from our sins. We thank you, Father, for showing us that we have victory through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for this word Father, may it continue to prick our lives, touch our hearts, and transform us to be the people you have called us to be. Father, we pray and ask for those who are sick and afflicted, that you, you bless them with health, that, Father, you heal them uh, as according to your will. Father, we pray for those who may be traveling, and those who are uh, uh, on these dangerous highways. Give them traveling grace, Father, and protect them that they make it to where they're going safely and to be back safely. Father, we just give you praise. And Father, bless us and, and, and uh, infuse in us proper understanding so that we will know what true worship is, that we will have a clear understanding of who we're worshiping and why we worship. Father, I thank you. I glorify your name and we praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.